Well, Paul, you just turned 92 years old. I don't get a chance to talk to people who've had so much life experience as you. So before we delve into extinctions and your new book, just give us a sense of, you know, what you've lived through and if you are feeling optimistic or still pessimistic or maybe neutral or waiting to see, what um, is your sense of how things I'd are like going? I like to think of myself as, I like to think of myself as, um, as objective as possible, knowing full well, and I've actually worked in some of these areas that scientists un always bring to their work, their personalities, their background, their prejudices, the prejudices of their society, and so on. I think the main thing that separates scientists from most other scholars is that they always insist on their work being reviewed by other scientists. And we set up the system pretty much so other scientists can make points by showing other scientists are wrong. Uh, uh, the guy who got the Nobel Prize for uh, finding out how your semicircular canals, as I recall, helped your balance, another guy got a Nobel Prize for showing that he didn't have the system right. Um, so uh, we're always, we're used to being reviewed heavily, and you get used to it, but never totally. I mean, when my mistakes are pointed out to me, I don't thrill at it, but I do try and learn from it. Let's put it that way. And and what would be and the I biggest guess, mistakes you, um, you feel you've made? The biggest mistake I ever made was putting scenarios in the population bomb. That was mm. because even though I stated these are just little stories about the future to help you think about it, at least, I don't know, maybe several hundred people made livings pointing out that my scenarios didn't come true. I wish that I was a perfect predictor. I wish that everything I predicted about what was going to happen to the world had happened. If that was the case, I would have worked the stock market very well, and you and I wouldn't be wasting time here. We'd be sitting on the beach at Bora Bora near my mansion, uh, having <laughs> drinks and admiring the other bathers, but uh, no such luck. <laughs> Okay, fair enough. That's uh, that that shows you have intellectual character to admit that. Uh, yeah, because I've read all those critiques of you and and how you were wrong about population uh, bombs exploding and so on. And a lot of that didn't happen. Uh, but still, in a way, uh, one of the critiques I have of the environmental movement is they don't take enough credit for the progress that we've made. In other words, a lot of environmentalists warned us about these things, and we did a lot of. Uh, a good things to bring about yeah. some solutions. Oh, one, one, one of the things that we covered, of course, not being able to read my own book, I've got to listen to it, which is really hard. Um, <laughs> but one of the things we covered is all the things we are doing and trying to do, and many people are concerned. One of the things that makes me a pessimist, however, um, is that we uh, see now a very large group of politicians who are determined to end most of those efforts. The most, the classic example is that uh, a recent president of the United States completely ended the programs that had been established to warn us about pandemics. Uh, and you talk about, I mean, I have uh, thought a lot and have uh, mixed views on how governments should and don't work. But one of the things that's clear is that you and I can't predict whether we're going to have a pandemic. That's something that requires a lot of care over uh, a, a lot of people. And we had started to develop mechanisms, not me, it's an area I'm, I've been involved in only very marginally talking about uh, how global change is increasing the probability of pandemics. But lots of other people are worried about that, and they had established um, ways of dealing, of trying to deal with it better. And those were just discarded by a presidential uh, administration. So that, that doesn't make me optimistic. Mm. Uh, but on the other hand, we have 8 billion people now, and it looks like we're going to top out at maybe 9 or 10 and then go back down to around 8, 7, 6, maybe even lower by the end of the century. Because oh, I think we'll go down way below the 
the most the, the most thorough estimate recently of where we'll go down to if we persist, if we survive as a civilization, was done by the top economist in the world. Now that my friend Ken Arrow is dead, it's Sir Partha Dasgupta in England, and the British government basically gave him a large crew and money to look at the issue of um, the economics of biodiversity, which in a sense is the topic of, of uh, the new book, of uh, Before They Vanish. And Dasgupta looked at it very carefully and came as an economist and with economists and came to the conclusion that humanity might be able to support three, a little over three billion people if everybody agreed to live at a Mexican standard of living. Right now, we have over it, about eight billion people. And uh, even the Mexicans want to increase their standard of living. Uh, and my two closest colleagues in writing this book are both Mexicans. So I'm very familiar with Mexican uh, uh, attitudes on things. They're both, by the way, members of the U.S. National Academy. Uh, and one of the pleasures of my life has been, while I've gotten huge amounts of criticism, basically none at all from any group of natural scientists who look at ecological, environmental, economic, and so on issues. In other words, uh, I can easily stand all the insults in the Wall Street Journal and the New York Times by their... Um, the people they hired and published nonsense, uh, because I too am a member of the U.S. National Academy. I've gotten the equivalent of the Nobel Prize and about 25 other prizes. I'm a member of the British Royal Society. And all that stuff really doesn't mean that much, except it means that I'm not getting criticized by my fellow scientists. I'm getting criticized by people who have a stake in how many people there are in the world. And the main beneficiaries, one of my colleagues said just the other day, uh, Larry Goulder, who's in our economics department here, and um, he said the only people who benefit from more and more people is the uh, already morbidly rich. And they're going to pay the price eventually. I mean, what can I say? Uh, <laughs> Criticize me, fine. I'm not going to change my views because some people say, just assert that I'm wrong. Uh, yeah, I have been wrong about the details of the collapse that we're now in. Uh, just like the economists are always wrong about the details of what's going to happen with the interest rates, with the a number of unemployed, et cetera, et cetera but they try and look at the general trends, uh, and so do scientists. And any time, look, human beings started uh, predicting uh, our ancestors, our distant, distant ancestors, uh, hundreds of millions of years ago, started predicting when, when they came out of the water and got on the land. That was when there was enough of an ozone layer to, to let animals live on land, and therefore they could see in the distance. When you were swimming around in the tropical oceans, um, when you came up to a, you saw things close to you, and when you came up to a coral reef, you couldn't tell how distant it was and where you could get through it. But on land, when you were walking along and you saw a mountain ahead of you, you could plan on going one side or the other, and you might be right or you might be wrong. And everybody plans all the time, and everybody knows they can't predict exactly what's going to be the trajectory they're going to follow, but they make a guess, and then they find out whether they're right or wrong, and a huge benefit and penalty of living oh, too long like I have uh, is that you find out when you were right and when you were wrong, well, and then you pay the price for them, or people <laughs> nice. attempt it gets you to pay the price for it. As I read it, I, I uh, first of all, responding to what you said, you know, I live in Santa Barbara, you live in Palo Alto. 
you know, I want you to live at the level of a Californian, not a Mexican. I want everybody to live at that level. It seems to me that that's actually good for the environment. That is to say, when you get people wealthy and healthy and educated, they have fewer babies. They care about the environment. They care about species uh, and they want to do good things. If you're poor and starving and you don't know where your next meal is coming from and you don't have a, a, a roof over your head, you can't really care about, uh, you know, the environment a thousand years from now or whether species are going extinct in some other part of the globe. So it seems to me part of the solution is is just make everybody wealthier and healthier and educated. I, I'm in total agreement with you. The issue is, can we? And is there any real attempt to do it? And are people any happier? This One of the things the economists have studied is whether the increase, say, over the last 30 years uh, of measures like GDP have made people any happier. And the general answer, regardless of country, the study's been done, I believe, in Europe and North America and Japan. And there hasn't been any increase in happiness, uh, except maybe among those few people who are the uh, incredibly wealthy, uh, although I even doubt it there. So I think one of the problems is that the things that you mentioned, which you and I would share as goals, um, have not been the goals of the system. The goals of the system have been to transfer well, uh, certainly for the last 40 years, and in the United States, it's been to transfer wealth uh, from the poor and the middle class to, a, uh, as you know from the details, uh, incredible uh, wealth for a few, very few individuals. But if we could do it, I mean, the way I would say from the data I can see that we could do it, we might have one or two billion people living the kind of life that you just described. But the attempt to get there is wrecking our life support systems. That's what um, before they vanish, is talking about the only kind of capital that human beings can survive and civilization can survive, uh, can't survive without. That is, the capital we're utterly dependent on is the living capital, the biodiversity that runs the systems we evolved in and the systems we must continue on. And my basic solution, until somebody shows me it's wrong, has to be redistribution. You know, we can make everybody happy if we have fewer bodies and we are a lot better at taking care of the people who are on the shorter end of the economic stick. But I'm, you, what you said is, I think, perfectly correct. The issue is, what are the costs and benefits and possibilities of getting there? Northern European countries uh, have a much wider distribution of wealth and lower income inequality. Sweden, Denmark, Norway, Germany, France, and so on. They care about the environment. So are you more hopeful that those countries are doing uh, the right thing and that we should use them as a model? Well, one of the most hopeful things is, of course, that their total fertility rates have dropped. And if you want, if you believe as I and all of my, every last one of my colleagues, I'm talking here for hundreds and hundreds of scientists and actually 15,000 scientists said it about a decade or two ago. Um, if you believe there are too many people in the world and that's a major cause of our problems, uh, then the best news is that in Europe, to a degree in North America, in Japan, in some parts of East Asia, uh, total fertility rates have dropped, and the size of the population in a few places is actually declining. And that is wonderful news, uh, because they, of course, the, the problem isn't the number of people as a number, it's what each one consumes, how much plastics each one demands, how much chemicals that are mimicking our hormones, each one demands. And so uh, if you, if there are too many rich people, not too many poor people in the world, uh, although in, in the sense there's too many poor people because there should be none. We should be able as a very intelligent, cooperative primate uh, 
be able to take care of everyone. That ought to be our goal, not to have people sleeping on the streets, not to have people uh, malnourished, or importantly, as we have so much today, micronutrient malnourished. Um, so, so I'm ranting at you. <laughs> well, that's that that that's fine, but uh, it seems to me that you know the statement is just too many people. Well, then who's who's going to do the culling? Right. In other words, there's a there's a little bit of a sense of anti-humanism in parts of the uh, environmental movement that I don't like. Uh, you know, why not treat people as as human capital as all worthy, you know, in a in a Kantian sense. Well, that we, everybody is valuable in and of themselves. And so the, our goal should be to make everybody wealthy, get everybody out of poverty. So we're in agreement there. But what's wrong with being wealthy? Nothing. In fact, it's good. It makes people care they, about the they, environment. They, Mm -hmm. uh, you're confusing two things. First of all, you're defining wealth as having lots of money. And no, in no, fact, the resources. Um, well, what we're doing now, of course, is trying to extract more and more from less and less. When we we got to remember, first of all, the present time is extraordinarily abnormal. Human beings, modern human beings, that is physically modern human beings, have been around for about 300,000 years. The current situation has developed over the last, since the development of agriculture, but more than that, which uh, agriculture allowed industrialization and allowed science and allowed podcasts and so on. And all of that is just a few, basically a few hundred years, now even less than that. We have moved into an extraordinarily unusual situation based on a one-time bonanza of fossil fuels that are killing us. And the, um, the, the fact that wealth, in some sense, can provide what you're talking about, that is, the great life and so on, it's only provided it to a tiny fraction of the modern human beings that have lived only recently and only still to a tiny fraction. Even the very rich who care about the world don't give up their 8,000 uh, square foot houses or their huge yachts and so on and so forth, uh, whereas people in our country are going hungry still, who don't have one of the reasons for the political mess today for the rise of the American Nazi Party, the GOP, has been that so many people have been left behind by the standard of wealth that our society tells us is so incredibly important. Well, that's pretty strong words there, Paul. Uh, yeah, uh, I would not call the GOP uh, a Nazi Party for sure. But in any case, you know, I was just in South Korea. Yeah, do there, you know the uh, history of how the, the Nazi Party yeah, I Do know. You know that. the let, history let, of how let, the Nazi let, Party got in power. It, yeah, I know the whole Same story way. in great detail. Yeah, not not not, not quite. Yeah, <laughs> but in any okay. case, uh, I was just in South well, Korea. Uh, their I, their yeah, their re replacement level is 0. 0.7, right? The re the the normal replacement level is 2.1 to maintain a population. So their population will be shrinking yeah. dramatically, and they're worried. Uh, not just not not just um, economically, but also uh, who's going to take care of their retired elderly when the workforce, labor force is way down because there's not enough people. Do you ever worry about um, populations uh, dropping too much, too rapidly? We, we worried a lot about it over the last 50 years. And the answer is complex, but in a sense, very simple. If we had started making the adjustments back when it was first clear to the scientific community, uh, certainly by the time of the scientific community getting together and protesting in the, around 1990, then we could have been planning for the changes that are going to come because it's strictly mathematics. It tells you when you have a growing population and you stop the growth, you're going to change the age composition. You can't, there's nothing you can do about that because it's straight math. It's, you can't just like you can't do anything about one and one being equal to two, even though Trump thinks it's five. Uh, and 
We have not taken the opportunities to make the changes, but they are trivial changes compared to what the changes are going to be in places which are already starting to be places where people can't even work outside because the temperatures are too high, where we no longer can have winter Olympic Games for some places or summer for others because the dramatic changes in the climate that are occurring much faster than the climate scientists originally thought. You know, we've known about climate change and the inevitability of it since the 1800s, but we've not done anything about it, and we're still not doing anything about it. And so uh, the, uh, I, the Koreans have got to make all kinds of changes. One of the problems, of course, is that the, dis the resources of the planet are not evenly distributed. And therefore, one of the things that people are going to do and are already doing is leaving areas that are suffering more and more from various shortages and forming great migratory waves, some of them boosted along by wars, which also have been connected with climate change and so on. So it's a really complicated picture, but believe me, solving the problems of age distribution uh, Finding out that you have to find new jobs for kindergarten teachers and so on are trivial. Trying to find a way to keep your air conditioning going when you can no longer burn coal or oil. It's, again, two bad problems, one much worse than the other, and most of the attention being played by a un really totally unconnected, uneducated press and uh, elite. Uh, I mean, <laughs> I could give you a long lecture on my university and its continual failure to do anything uh, sensible with its curriculum. So, <laughs> okay. what okay. can I do? Two other, uh, on that, uh, with uh, the problem of fossil fuels, are you encouraged by the rise of electric vehicles on, on one hand? And are, are, are you pro-nuclear power like your friend and colleague Stuart Brand uh, became uh, when he saw the, uh, how, how efficient and... Fall, and uh, carbon-free nuclear power is? I I'll go to nuclear power first. I'm neither, I, I, my best friend is John Holdren, arguably the best scientist in the world. He was Clinton's sub rosa science advisor, Obama's open science advisor, the head of um, the Office of, Bio, of Technology, o, OF, God, I'm getting old. I can't remember. OSTP, Office of Science and Technology, policy for the Obama administration. He wrote the Kone study on nuclear and other energy sources. And when I want to know something about nuclear power, I pick up the phone and I ask John. That's one of the advantages. Okay. I have similar advantages in other places. But what John says, it should be kept in the mix that we have it. There's all. It's not just a problem in, um, uh, in physics, it's a problem in psychology. Uh, it's clear that uh, in some ways and some places, uh, you ought to be able to use nuclear if you could guarantee that you wouldn't have any nuts uh, bombing nuclear plants or shelling them or using them as political tours in your uh, tools in your local war, they'd be a lot safer. What John says about fusion power, that's I'm talking there about fission power. Fusion power has been 30 years off uh, since about 1960. It's still said to be 30 years off. Uh, John thinks that's a joke, too, that it might pop be eventually possible. But as he and I published decades ago, uh, giving humanity a infinite source of cheap uh, energy would be like giving an idiot child a machine gun. It would just finish paving the earth with uh, asphalt and covering them with electric cars uh, whose uh, electricity would be miraculously generated on Mars. And it's just the illusions. There is a person, I won't mention his name, who thinks we're going to terraform Mars and move there. You can you can read about Elon. it on the web if you want to. Yeah, yeah. yeah. 
Well, Elon I like what, what Elon's done. Uh, I, anyway, I like what Elon's done with electric vehicles. He, I mean, I, I think this is a great idea, don't you? What, what he's, uh, yeah. first of all, electric ve vehicles need more than the uh, energy coming in to generate the electricity. They, they need roads to run on. They need all kinds of materials to make them and so on. And uh, it's not I'm against electric vehicles. It's, I'm against having too many of them. I'm against giving them only to really rich people. I'm actually against everybody owning a separate electric vehicle because if we had a sensible society, we would have developed it differently. We would have more sharing of private vehicles uh, and put the money and effort there and other things to make people happy. Uh, it's, again, a very complex area which we've put a lot of thought into, but there's still a lot of thought that's needed, and most of it isn't even being considered in the education system. Now, what's research yeah. going into? Uh, yeah. More, well, I, the I, most, I do think... The scariest... Uh, oh, sorry. sorry. <laughs> yeah, I, I do think... Yeah, the, you go. The, you're, the, you're the boss. Okay, the, the idea of ride sharing is becoming more popular. I think that's a... A matter of both culture and technology, like how Ubers uh, and Lyfts took over from taxis, much more efficient. Um, and there are plenty of entrepreneurs who are trying to bring about this idea of of uh, sharing private vehicles or bicycles or whatever, so we'd have less stuff. That 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 could happen. Maybe not in Southern California. So, maybe in New York City you, or something like that. Sometimes you and I ought to have a discussion or a debate about one of the, there are a number of issues that I think are really important to all of this, but one of them is, is there an optimal level of uh, differentiation? That is, uh, do we do better by having some people better off than others? Uh, and what would, should be the minimum standard of living and so on? Another one is, are borders ethical? Uh, you know, if you have all kinds of good stuff, and then their neighbor country uh, starts suffering because of climate change. Is it ethical for you to keep them out? And uh, these are, there are, there's a whole s series of moral and ethical issues that underlie all of this and that I think never should be ignored. But finding the answers to them is really, really difficult. Uh, yeah. The, there's a famous uh, paper published, I don't know, about three years ago by economists who pointed out that the, uh, by, if you were in one of the rich countries, that means Europe here, a Japan, uh, Korea, uh, that the best thing you could do for the environment is to have one less child. And they calculated that that was equivalent to persuading 23 of your buddies to stop driving entirely and get rid of their cars. It's, you got to do the numbers on a lot of this stuff. That's where Elon just doesn't get it when he talks about uh, terraforming Mars, when actually he and his buddies are Martian forming Earth. They are, that's what, again, the book, Vanish, uh, Before They Vanish, talks about reducing the number of, ki of living organisms in the universe, particularly on Earth. And of course, Mars has none. And that's what he's trying to fix Earth to be just like Mars. He talks about terraforming Mars, but actually he's Martian forming Earth. <laughs> I haven't heard that. That's funny. Um, okay, so uh, uh, let's talk about um, the sixth max extinction. How do you know when a species has really gone extinct? Just give us a little sense of how biologists keep track of these things. And how do you know there isn't one last Legit whatever out there somewhere. And we mentioned some of the cases in the book where we where scientists thought something was extinct and they popped up again. The most dramatic case from my point of view uh, is uh, the fish uh, that we that the scientific community thought went extinct uh, more than 60 million years ago. And in 19, I think it was about 38, again, since I can't read, I can't read my book and yes. tell you what it says. See, like, yeah. But it's something in there, something like 1938, one turned up 
uh, off the coast of Africa. And that was this thing called Latimeria. But big, this was not a tiny little thing that people could easily miss. It was something that turned out to be fishable, and some of them were big, big fish. And uh, so that was a surprise. And when I was uh, an undergraduate, I heard about that in my evolution course and so on, and that was really interesting. And then it turned up somewhere in Southeast Asia. I don't remember. This is another population. So some things um, may be thought to be extinct and come back. I would still, if I were in the southeastern United States, uh, occasionally wander out if I could still see and bird watch. I can only bird here now, uh, see if I could run into a Bachman's warbler, which is unlike Latimeria. They were about this big, and the last ones were seen with all the bird watchers there are uh, about 20 or 30, 40 years ago. I don't remember. Exactly. So you can't ever be super sure. But what you can be sure of is that many organisms have declined to the point where they never can do the services for us we want, even if the service is the pleasure of seeing a rare bird. Um, the, uh, the big fuss over the ivory-billed woodpecker, which, off, which was recently, maybe 20 years ago, uh, claimed to be sighted again in the southeast. I think most people think it doesn't exist there anymore, but people keep an eye out for it. So uh, as populations get smaller and smaller, the odds of having one go extinct and, um, and not be noticed uh, are smaller and smaller, but the cases do occur and they'll continue to occur. Because so many things have had their population size shrunk. But we'll know probably when the last elephant dies. Uh, we'll know. If I, I won't know, but somebody will know. Um, what, the most dramatic way to see what's happening is to look at distribution maps. And you see that the lion once covered virtually all of Africa, some, I believe, some of southern Europe, parts of India. And now there are very few lion populations thriving, elephants even more so, and so on. The really big things that tourists pay attention to, you keep track of. But the insects, which are much more critical to you and me than the elephants? No way. I got colleagues of mine in, uh, at a lab in Colorado where I worked for four, or five, four decades, five decades, tracked the amount of insects in the area, and I worked on insects there, uh, using traps which just simply collected the flying insects. And in the last 35 years, the insect fauna in this relatively undisturbed area has been cut in half. And that's exactly what's been found in southern Euro in uh, Germany and other places. The insects are disappearing, and who gives a shit, you know? Uh, well... First of all, if you like birds, the bird populations are shrinking too, so we are headed towards another silent spring. But of course, the insects are crucial to our lives in many ways, uh, and uh, we're seeing all kinds of effects from extinction there affecting humanity. Let me read the opening paragraph from There's, your by book. the way, hundreds of references. And... Sure. Yeah, I got it. Human beings are the only animals that speak about morals, about right and wrong. Morals differ among communities and individuals as well as over time. In this book, we deal with a widespread sense that it is right to preserve the only living beings known to exist, as well as the civilization of Homo sapiens. So I'm glad to hear you say that, because a lot of environmentalists are, are, are kind of antinatal. They don't think people should have babies. They don't even like humans. They're anti-human. Um, and, you know, or you see these extremists that are blocking roads or they throw tomato soup on a, on a, a, a canvas, you know, a painting in a, in a museum and so on. And this tends to turn people off and make people less likely to support uh, those kind of causes. So I gather you're not in that extremist category. And if not, not, what, not at what all. Can First of all, uh, now, we can do all sorts of things. First of all, is educate people throughout our educational system about how we as human beings are utterly dependent on the natural systems of this planet, basically. 
Now, it may be that there are thriving civilizations on a million other planets. That is possible. All kinds of things are possible. But what we know is possible is that we have a life support system here, and we have developed one kind of organism. That's us. Uh, that uh, most of us like various things, even though there are cultural differences. Uh, I think it's fair to say that most adult human beings like having shelter, having food, getting laid, uh, and so on. You have a list of things that we all enjoy and would like uh, to continue. And therefore, my and I and the other thing that's, as far as we know, unique with human beings is we're the only organism that has developed uh, ideas of ethics and morals, what's right and what's wrong. They also can vary from group to group, but they share certain uh, characteristics uh, like uh, not uh, generally being against killing on a one-to-one -one basis, but in favor of doing it if you can do it in huge mobs. Uh, and uh, therefore, with our, with our moral system, uh, one of the things we shouldn't do is beat up on people who uh, are making their live. Take a, a people who are doing uh, lumbering and the kind of uh, uh, things that people have done, like driving nails into trees to discourage um, uh, timbering. There are a lot of reasons to preserve forests as well as we can and to use them in ways that are. Uh, better ecologically, let's put it that way. But putting people who have to work there at risk is just immoral as far as I'm concerned. Uh, the same thing goes, uh, all of us have to make that kind of decision, but beating up on other people to prove your point is something I'm just against. And uh, so, uh, just like I'm against, uh, the, uh, for instance, I've written I was a co-founder of um, desegregation by using mixed groups in Lawrence, Kansas. We desegregated the restaurants, and I've written books and many papers on trying to point out that unlike what William Shockley said at Stanford, human beings are not color-coded for quality, uh, and that in fact uh, what somebody's skin color is has virtually nothing to do with their basic abilities, attitudes, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, while it can change their attitudes because of the cultural uh, connections that people make falsely uh, with skin color or with gender, for that matter, and so on. So, uh, no, I'm not in favor. I'm in favor of protests. I'm in favor of being uh, loud. I guess is the way to put it. Uh, Jim Hansen, maybe the top climatologist in the world, you may have seen some of his stuff. Yeah, I know. Um, I know. Published an article not long ago about how scientists had to stop being so reticent. You know, he 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 turned in a paper uh, to a journal, with the title of which was "At what level does the climate disruption become really dangerous?" And the editor said we shouldn't use a word like dangerous. How oh, dangerous seems to me that being unable for human beings to function at the temperature is a pretty damn good uh, word to use in that context. Uh, but there's the uh, somehow the idea that scientists uh, give up their their positions as citizens uh, when they try and warn about what's going on. And I obviously don't take that position, although, you know, in science or outside of science, in our system, other people can have different views and criticize you, and you have to deal with the criticism if you want to, or ignore it if you don't. Okay. Um, well, I'm pro-human. You must pro have gone through a lot of this uh, years. Oh, I have, yes. And, and uh, it, I, want everybody to, I want everybody to live at the level of a Western uh, civilization, but I'm also pro elephant. I, I love elephants. I don't want lions to go extinct and so on. Can I have both? Okay, no, let's, let's play this out for, for a second. <laughs> yeah, you can have both. 
Uh, and okay, how? The, Walk us through um, how we can do this. Uh, what? Well, the 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 main way to get everybody to start thinking about these things and putting their effort not into how we can all grow more, that is the, the poor, the rich, and so on, but how we can switch gradually to a smaller population where everybody can have all the things you and I think are desirable without making it less likely that our children or grandchildren or great-grandchildren will be able to have the same thing. Uh, the understanding that we're on a finite planet that we are the dominant animal on that planet, but our dominance is maintained by all the other organisms. And if we give them up, we give ourselves up. And I think that, uh, for example, we talked a little bit, we talk a lot in the book about ecosystem services, the things that the natural systems provide us with and how they're slowly disappearing. How many schools do you think actually teach a course in ecosystem services? I'll give you an, an even better example. I, I'm having dinner tonight with, the, with Bill Perry, who was once our um, Secretary of Defense. And Bill is even older than I am and has used the last part of his career uh, trying to get rid of nuclear weapons. Mm -hmm. And uh, I've done much the same. And I think, and I believe I can speak for Bill and a lot of my colleagues, that the biggest threat we have today is not nuclear war, uh, not uh, climate warming, not the loss of biodiversity per se, and so on, but for immediate, for what might happen to me and you and our kids is the chance of having a large-scale nuclear war. And you now, of course, get a lot of discussion of it. Is Putin crazy enough to do it? Is et cetera, et cetera. Should we give longer range missiles to oh, Ukraine? What really, that's, those are really scary questions. But even more scary is in the present situation, what's happening to the odds of a near miss, a close uh, encounter? And would there they should be teaching in every American school the history of Proud Prophet and the submarine, Russian submarine captain and so on and so forth. Everybody would be scared out of their minds about the existence of nuclear weapons. But I don't think at Stanford, 95% uh, of the students or faculty ever heard of Proud Prophet, ever heard of the... Um, the uh, Norwegian missile launch that was mistaken for a full-scale attack. Never um, hear about the the guy who loaded the wrong thing into the computer, and it was a test thing to practice what it would look like at a full-scale attack, but it came across as a full-scale attack. In, in instance after instance, the safety systems haven't saved us it's been single individuals, you know, probably know these, these the rest, single individuals who said, no, I'm not going to blow up the world, even though they say the system says we should. Uh, I don't know how I got on that rant, but it really worries well, me. Well, that's Let's all right. Stan that uh, Stanislav, Stanislav Petrov is the man who saved the world. Uh, and uh, yeah, I, I've done half a is dozen the episodes Russian of the show. Mix yeah, summer? he's the Russian guy. Yeah, yeah. No, no, not the, no, no. He was in charge of the radar screen. Where he saw five blips on the screen, oh, yeah. he was supposed to he was supposed to call his boss and report a incoming missile attack from the United States, and he correctly reasoned that if the United States was launching a full uh, attack to eliminate all Russian uh, nuclear missiles, it wouldn't be five, <laughs> and so he correctly deduced yeah. it was a, well, a false positive. The, the, about 40, 50, 60 years ago, John, when we were doing the nuclear winter studies. John Holder and I did a back-of-the-envelope calculation, and it turned out that the number of Hiroshima-sized bombs, that's 15 kilotons, uh, necessary to destroy the United States permanently was roughly a dozen, and that fewer would do Russia. And the reason is, of course, all you have to do is hit the transport centers and bring down the electric grid, everybody starves. 
Uh, you can't pump gas and you can't run trains. That's it, because almost nobody is actually in. And Russia had fewer nodes than we did, so it didn't take mm -hmm. as, wouldn't take as many bombs. And of course, both the countries have thousands now, much huger bombs than the uh, Hiroshima side. So, although far fewer than anybody in, you in can the warn, height in warn. the late late nineteen eighties, when there were about seventy thousand nuclear weapons, we're down to about twelve thousand five hundred. Yeah, yeah, uh, um, yeah I, I will overkill. agree with you. Uh, yeah, I would agree with you, Paul, on on the problem of nuclear weapons. Uh, and certainly the loss of biodiversity is another concern, although it won't necessarily lead to the extinction of our species. It is a, it is a big concern. So two controversial issues there that you bring up in the book. Uh, give us your thoughts on cloning extinct species. Can we bring back the woolly mammoth and the Tasmanian tiger and so on? Would that be ethical? Is it technologically even possible? Well, as I think we say in the book, and I'm not sure, but... Um, the, it would be silly for any scientist to say that it's impossible. And you, of course, the question of whether the simulation you produced was really the thing again and how close it had to be and so on uh, is a question. There's no question at the moment where, I mean, my molecular biology friends uh, tell me, you know, that, that it would be extraordinarily expensive to even make a reasonable simulation by, say, taking a, a, a wood pigeon and turning it into a passenger pigeon. The second, the big, the second big barrier there is uh, what the hell do you do with them after you get them? For instance, they often talk about um, recreating the passenger pigeon, but we know that at least as they went extinct, they required huge million bird flocks to persist and be able to breed. So the issue then becomes, how do you produce a million birds uh, in order to get them? Well, suppose maybe you can figure out how to breed and reproduce them, how to get them reproduced. And you now have uh, cages in your house with a million passenger pigeons in them. Where the hell do you put them? Because the plants they fed on and the masts and so on no longer exist. So all of those things make it seem unlikely that we're going to get there. And I think that I've said many times the biggest problem is moral hazard. That is, if people think we're going to, we can just reproduce organisms we make extinct, uh, then we don't have to worry about making them extinct. Moral hazard's an economist's idea that uh, if you can get flood ex insurance, then you might as well just build in a floodplain. What the hell? If you're going to get somebody else to pay uh, or some future group to pay the price, then you are more likely to do it. And I think moral hazard's a big thing with de-extinction. On the other hand, yeah. uh, I'd, I'd love to see a velociraptor uh, or two. <laughs> I don't know about As that. a matter of fact, I, I know some attorneys. Yeah, I get. <laughs> oh my God, you are too funny. <laughs> Obviously, if you're going to put effort in when you have limited resources, either building back populations of things that have almost gone extinct, uh, or protecting relatively common things, is a better way to go. And we know that can work. Uh, I suspect that many listeners to this or viewers of this podcast will have seen outdoors a, an American bison. There are herds now in various places of American bison, but they almost went extinct. In fact, the U.S. government tried to make them extinct because they were the food of the Native Americans. And as you know, we wanted to make Native Americans extinct. We still probably do. Uh, considering the way things are going. but um, So you can restore if you have something, but re making a bison out of a cow is may well be possible, but it isn't the way I would su suggest putting our resources. Okay, another controversial idea. Um, this gets back to your colleague uh, Garrett Hardin's famous paper about the tragedy of the commons. If nobody owns the land, then no one cares about it and takes care of it. So what about privatizing, I don't know, say, reserves where there's elephants, where the owner of the land cares about the elephants 
maybe they sell a hunting license or you get you get to bag one elephant a year or something and you have to pay a huge amount of money there at least somebody cares about the land how about that as a solution i got nothing against i have nothing against those things if they're done right um the but it goes back to very very basic questions which only came up again we're in a very unusual time for our species 300,000 years of our species and only since agriculture could anybody possess any land or anything at all. In other words, once people could make um, and uh, could produce in your family enough food to feed your family plus some more, then you could have division of labor and so on. Some people could be richer and poorer. People could lay claim to land and so on. And now that we have that system, uh, I see nothing horrible about trying to use it to enhance the preservation of biodiversity. It's the system we've got. It's like, um, to talk about really controversial stuff, uh, the arguments we face in the Middle East over who owns what and why. And at one level, uh, I thought it was a very silly idea to establish Israel because I was already thinking about those things back in the 1940s. Uh, I thought it would be better to bring the uh, refugees from Hitler to the United States, but anti-Semitism in the State Department didn't prevent it. If we had them here, then they would not be fighting with the Palestinians. On the other hand, now that we have it, we have the problem, which hopefully we both agree on, of finding a way for those people to live together uh, happily and prospering because they're all, among other things, they're the, the local people who are most uh, like us in terms of intellectual interest and so on and so forth. So uh, the, the problem of dealing with our unusual situation has not been solved. Agriculture, Robert Topsapolsky, who uh, is, I don't know if you ever read anything of his books, or anything, but I've Sapolsky and I agree the big mistake. You got determined? I oh, read yeah. it as a man. Determined. Anyway. Yeah, yeah. The um but but uh we don't know yet if if we have the large scale nuclear war and either civilization or humanity disappears, then our big mistake was learning agriculture. You know, if you're <laughs> yes. uh Right. A, uh, yeah, I, I mean, we 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 had a system where we didn't have to have governments per se because we had small enough groups that everybody knew each other. And uh, I remember when I lived with the Eskimos, with the Inuit, um, Tommy Bruce telling me, I asked him, how do you deal with um, people who are uh, not behaving properly? And he basically said, I'll scare, spare you the accent because my Anuktitut is now very old. But he said, um, we either ostracize them or I'll take them out on a seal hunt. And just as I'm about to shoot the seal, his head gets in my way. He says, I ornamut, which I ornamut is my Anuktitut word that I think is one I'd bring into English. It means that's the way the bagel breaks. Uh, but, you know, in those days, the people who did the leading were the good people at it. The, the one who led the hunts was the best hunter. The woman who was in charge of curing was the one who knew all the plants that were their medicinal properties. And now we've moved to a so many, having so many people, we've got to have governments. And I don't have to draw you a diagram for what that can do. Right, but we're not going back to hunter-gatherer days, so we have to move forward in some positive way. So, how can we improve government? So, right, let's not. get back to your let's get back to your book. Uh, a lot of these stressed out uh, species that are on the brink of going extinct are in countries where the government is unable to protect them because they're so poor that the people have to use those resources, or they have to tear down the forest to make basic products, or they're you know, and so on. So. It isn't part of the problem corrupt governments and poverty of the people? Oh, there's, there's absolutely no question that a huge part of the problem is corrupt government and, and uh, 
property rights. Yeah. And uh, the, one of the first books I ever wrote was on this topic. I called it ARC Two. Now the ideas weren't very good, but the basic, the most basic idea was that government activities should be saved for the things that is as far as possible for the things that individuals could not do for themselves. That is, you and I are against nuclear war, but neither of us can uh, shoot down the incoming missiles if necessary. That's something our government has to be able to do. And that's uh, where, when, when I wrote my, my memoir, I said, uh, the journey through science and politics, because the two are totally intermixed. Um, if you don't try and think hard about how governments can function better and um, so on. And of course, as a pedant, I always get back to improving the education system, but it's not crystal clear. I mean, uh, I once, I, the, my favorite historian, I think, at the moment is Naomi Oreskes. And she's the one who wrote the book about um, climate change, about the, I can't Merchant, remember the title, yeah, but her of, big book. Merchants of Doubt. Merchants of Doubt. But she wrote a book on the big myth uh, about basically saying the way to run the world is with unregulated um, uh, corporations. And uh, it, it just is the sort of thing that I thought uh, everybody should read. We've had a, we had a little contest, some of us, about whether Stanford or Harvard was stupider as, as great, great universities. Harvard eventually won when their business school, discovering that their faculty were getting malnourished, their junior faculty, because their salaries were too low, Harvard Business School gave them advice on how to get food stamps. And so they won. <laughs> but when we, the argument was still going on, uh, I was saying Stanford wins because we produced Josh Hawley. And she came back immediately with Ted Cruz. So there's, it takes more than the education system. <laughs> You're going to have to help and your children help figure out how we can do it so people behave better by our standards. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I know Naomi. She's been on the show a couple of times, both for the Merchants of Doubt and the uh, the Big Myth, and as has Polsky for several of I'm his I'm glad you his had books. her. The on. Big Myth, yeah. No, she's great. She's uh, it's a, it's she's, really yeah. It's an important tension there between again private property, private industry, markets, and so on, and government. Obviously, corporations need regulation, or else they'll cheat the system if they can. Uh, as we've seen, the <clears throat> big pharma does. Uh, capture the regulatory state, as we saw in the opioid crisis. They just yeah, bought them off, you know, so it, it happens. And so obviously, you know, we need, you know, better government. Okay, fine. Do you support then foreign or, aid well, to some yeah, of these I, I, foreign I, countries uh, from the United States to, for, to solve oh, this problem? Of oh, 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 I'm uh, John, John Holdren had his appointment to the head of OSTP, if I recall correctly, I don't, you can broadcast it, but don't quote me, <laughs> uh, because he and I had written with Ann uh, in um, Ecoscience, a big uh, textbook of environmental things, the need for de-development. What that basically was, was redistribution. That the way to, that that's, first of all, the loss of biodiversity is a global issue. We can't say it's your job to do it, but you, but you don't. You could say we can't. We're too poor. No, uh, we've got to arrange the world so that everybody can deal with those problems and where everybody can eat well and so on. That's, in my view, a redistribution problem. But that's poison. I mean, then I would be called a communist or a socialist by people who have no idea what communism or socialism is or have never read anything about it. So, they, uh, but it's, uh, the problems of governance are much tougher than the problems of biology. In other words, we, we wrote an entire book where we say, whether we're right or wrong, we have confidence that we know what's happening 
and we know what kinds of things could help. But in the government area, uh, the guys that I read, uh, um, I was thinking the, the Yale um, historian who's written so much on tyranny lately. Huh? Oh, Have you oh, had him on? Oh. Um, uh, no, but I know who you mean. Um, yes, on tyranny. Is you the name you of the lose book. the nouns first. That's what's yeah. happening to me. <laughs> That's but too anyway, funny. yeah, yeah. They're less sure, usually less sure about what exactly to do. Uh, and I'm a history buff, and um, I, I one of my favorite recent books was by um, Eric Larson. It's called The Demon of, I think, Uncertainty, but it, it talks about what happened between uh, the election of Lincoln and the start of the Civil War. And you can see the parallels. It's the same human beings we have today. We haven't solved the problem yet. Let's put it that way. All right, Paul. Let's let, let me ask you a couple cheery, of last cheery big, be. big questions here. Since you've been politically active for so long, uh, are we really living in the most polarized, controversial political violence era in our history? Or was 1968, let's say, uh, and Watergate and Vietnam and all that, is it just too distant? We forget that, and it was actually just as violent and polarizing. What are your thoughts on uh, I can, putting today into perspective? I have an easy answer to that question. It was just as, as far as I can tell, where it's obviously very difficult to measure, particularly since our statistics only go back with computers a certain distance, that it was just or even more violent uh, before the Civil War. Mm. And the battle over slavery. I mean, there was fist fights in the um, uh, in the Congress. Congress, uh, yeah. and one one senator was almost killed by another senator bashing him with his repeatedly with a bludgeon. I mean, this this wasn't <laughs> minor stuff. It wasn't somebody you know throwing a spitball. <laughs> okay. Last question, Paul. Uh, can, can you see a, a time? Let's say a I don't know a thousand years from now. When there's no more nation states, we don't need that anymore. We're back to city states where there's no uh, solid borders. People can travel and trade and 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 marry each other. And you know, there's a lot of these obstacles, moral, ideological, political, are are dissolved. And we're down to I don't know a billion people living very healthy, wealthy lives. Uh, I won't go down the path of multiplanetary species because <laughs> I know that's not your favorite topic, but something something yeah, like that, well, at least on uh, Earth, again, where, uh, sustainable. Yeah, at least on Earth, I could easily, again, if we get the right changes, I don't see any huge barriers to that, but the right changes are the critical thing, are willing. We've got to do so much now to make up for what we haven't done in the last thousand years or so. And yeah. that's, you could just think of the change we've been through. I would rather think of it as a change in 2,000 years if we, or say 1,000 years, uh, if we stop doing the things we're doing now to make it impossible. If there are no other organisms, we'll be gone. If there's a nu large-scale nuclear war, we'll be gone. Uh, if we don't do something serious about climate change, we're likely to be gone. I mean, again talking about the politics, the I'm worried when people realize how bad the climate disruption can be, that there'll be political consequences there that could easily lead to nuclear war. You know, if China starts modifying the atmosphere in one direction, then we in another, in order to try and spare us or them, uh, just think about it. So we keep bouncing back to the political issues. We get the will for everybody to get together and try and fix things. We've done it in groups and even as nations before. We could do it again. Yeah, that's a that's a nice way to put it there. I, I, I do think that physics isn't the hard science. Political science is the hard science. <laughs> There's just so many problems that are difficult it's, to solve, but we'll right. save that for another episode. Here it is. The, before they vanish, saving nature's population and ourselves. That's the uh, pro-human part. Uh, so, Paul, thank you for your work. Thanks for this book and for all your work and for admitting you were wrong about some things. A lot of people can't say that. So that's, you know, good on you.
<laughs> well, uh, I'm glad you continue to be skeptical. Keep it up. All right. 